Chapter Twenty Six of Our Vanishing Wildlife. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Jennings. Our Vanishing Wildlife by William T. Hornaday. Chapter Twenty Six: The Army of the Defense. It now seems that the friends of wildlife, who themselves are not on the firing line, should be afforded some definite information regarding the army of the defense, and its strength and weakness. It is an interesting subject, but the limitations of space will not permit an extended treatment. Over the world at large, I think the active destroyers outnumber the active defenders of wildlife, at least in the ratio of five hundred to one and the money available to the destroyers is to the funds of the defenders as five hundred is to one the average big game sportsman cheerfully expends from five hundred to one thousand dollars on a hunting trip but resents the suggestion that he should subscribe from fifty to a hundred dollars for wildlife preservation if he puts down ten dollars he thinks he has done a big thing Worse than this, I am forced to believe that at least seventy-five per cent of the big game sportsmen of the world have never contributed one dollar in money or one hour of effort to that cause. But there are exceptions, and I can name at least fifty sportsmen who have subscribed a hundred dollars each to campaign funds, and some who have given as high as a thousand dollars. Once I sat down beside a financially rich slaughterer of game, and asked him to subscribe a sum of real money in behalf of a very important campaign. I needed funds very much, and I explained, exhorted, and besought. I pointed out his duty to give back something in return for all the game slaughter that he had enjoyed. For ten long minutes he stood fire without flinching, and without once opening his lips to speak. He made no answer, no argument, no defense. And finally, he never gave up one cent. Wherever the English language is spoken, from Tasmania to Scotland, and from Puerto Rico to the Philippines, the spirit of wildlife protection exists. Elsewhere, there is much more to be said on this point. To all cosmopolitan sportsmen, the British Blue Book on Game Protection, the annual reports of the two great protective societies of London, and the annual progress report of the U.S. Department of Agriculture are reassuring and comforting. It is good to know that Uganda maintains a Department of Game Protection, A. L. Butler, Superintendent, that so good a man as Major J. Stevenson Hamilton is in control of protection in the Transvaal, and that even the native state of Kashmir officially recognizes the need to protect the remnant. There are, of course, many parts of the world in which game laws and limits to slaughter are quite unknown, all of which is entirely wrong, and in need of quick correction. No state or nation can be accounted wholly civilized that fails to recognize the necessity to protect wildlife. I am tempted to make a list of the states and nations that were at latest advices destitute of game laws and game protectors, but I fear to do injustice through lack of the latest information. However, the time has come to search out delinquents, and hold up each one to a mirror that will reflect its shortcomings. Naturally, we are most interested in our own contingent of the Army of the Defense. The United States Government. Today the feeling in Congress toward the conservation of wildlife and forests is admirable. Both houses are fully awake to the necessity of saving while there is yet something to be saved. The people of the United States may be assured that the national government is active and sympathetic in the prosecution of such conservation measures as it might justly be expected to promote. For example, during the past five years, we have seen Congress take favorable action on the following important causes, nearly every one of which cost money. The saving of the American bison, and four national ranges. The creation of 58 bird refuges. The creation of five great game preserves. The saving of the elk in Jackson Hole. The protection of the fur seal. The protection of the wildlife of Alaska. There are many active friends of wildlife who confidently expect to see this fine list gloriously rounded out by the passage in 1913 of an ideal bill for the federal protection of all migratory birds. To name the friends of wildlife in Congress would require the printing of a list of at least 200 names, and a history of the rise and progress of wildlife conservation by the national government would fill a volume. Such a volume would be highly desirable. When the story of the national government's part in wildlife protection is finally written, 
it will be found that while he was president, Theodore Roosevelt made a record in that field that is indeed enough to make a reign illustrious. He aided every wildlife cause that lay within the bounds of possibility, and he gave the vanishing birds and mammals the benefit of every doubt. He helped to establish three national bison herds, four national game preserves, fifty-three federal bird refuges, and to enact the Alaska Game Laws of 1902 and 1907. It was in 1904 that the national government elected to accept its share of the white man's burden and enter actively into the practical business of wildlife protection. This special work, originally undertaken and down to the present vigorously carried on by Dr. Theodore S. Palmer, has considerably changed the working policy of the Biological Survey of the Department of Agriculture, and greatly influenced game protection throughout the states. The game protection work of that bureau is alone worth to the people of this country at least twenty times more per annum than the entire annual cost of the bureau. Next to the splendid services of Dr. Palmer, all over the United States, one great value of the bureau is found in the fact and figure ammunition that it prepares and distributes for general use in assaults on the citadels of ignorance and greed. The publications of the bureau are of great practical value to the people of the United States. Dr. Palmer is a man of incalculable value to the cause of protection. No call for advice is too small to receive his immediate attention. No fight is too hot, and no danger point too remote to keep him from the fray. Wherever the army of destruction is making a particularly dangerous fight to repeal good laws and turn back the wheels of progress, there will he be found. As the warfare grows more intense, Congress may find it necessary to enlarge the fighting force of the biological survey. The work that has been done by the Bureau in determining the economic value or lack of value of our most important species of insectivorous birds has been worth millions to the agricultural interests of the United States. Through it we know where we stand. The reasons why we need to strive for protection can be expressed in figures and percentages, and it seems to me that they leave the American people no option but to protect. State Game Commissions each of our states, and each province of Canada, maintains either a state game commission of several persons, one commissioner, or a state game warden. All such officers are officially charged with the duty of looking after the general welfare of the game and other wildlife of their respective states. Theoretically, one of the chief duties of a state game commission is to initiate new legislative bills that are necessary, and advocate their translation into law. The official standing of most game commissioners is such that they can successfully do this. In 1909, Governor Hughes of New York went so far as to let it be known that he would sign no new game bill that did not meet the approval of State Game Commissioner James S. Whipple. As a general working principle, and quite aside from Mr. Whipple, that was wrong, because even a State Game Commissioner is not necessarily infallible, or always on the right side of every wildlife question. As a rule, state commissioners and state wardens are keenly alive to the needs of their states in new game protective legislation, and a large percentage of the best existing laws are due to their initiative. Often, however, their usefulness is limited by the trammels of public office, and there are times when such officers cannot be too aggressive without the risk of arousing hostile influences and handicapping their own departmental work. For this reason, it is often advisable that bills which propose great and drastic reforms, and which are likely to become storm centers, should originate outside the Commissioner's office, and be pushed by men who are perfectly free to abide the fortunes of open warfare. It should be distinctly understood, however, that lobbying in behalf of wildlife measures is an important part of the legitimate duty of every state game commissioner, and is a most honorable calling. Of the many strong and aggressive state game commissions that I would like to mention in detail, space permits the naming of only a very few, by way of illustration. New York Thanks to the great conservation governor of this state, John A. Dix, the year 1911 saw our forest, fish, and game business established on an ideal business basis. Realizing the folly of requiring a single man to manage those three great interests, and render to each the attention that it deserves and requires, by a well-studied legislative act a state conservation commission was created, consisting of three commissioners, one for each of the three great natural departments. These are salaried officers, who devote their entire time to their work, and are properly equipped with assistants. 
The state force of game wardens now consists of a hundred and twenty-five picked men, each on a salary of nine hundred dollars per year, and through a rigid system of daily reports, inaugurated by John B. Burnham, the activities and results of each warden promptly become known in detail at headquarters. Fortunately, New York contains a very large number of true sportsmen who are ever ready to come forward in support of every great measure for wildlife protection. The spirit of real protection runs throughout the state, and in time I predict that it will result in a great recovery of the native game of the Commonwealth. That will be after we have stopped all shooting of upland game birds and shore birds for about eight years. Even the pinnated grouse could be successfully introduced over one-third of the state, if the people would have it so. It was our great body of conscientious sportsmen who made possible the bain Blovelt law, and the new codification of the game laws of the state. Tennessee Clearly, honorable mention belongs to the unsalaried State Commissioner of Tennessee, Colonel J. H. Acklin. Then whom, says Dr. Palmer, there is no more active and enthusiastic game protectionist in this country. Whatever has been accomplished in that state is due to his activity and public spirit. Colonel Acklin, who is now president of the National Association of Game Commissioners, is a prominent lawyer, and enjoys the distinction of being the only commissioner in the country who not only serves without pay, but also defrays a large part of the expenses of game protection out of his own pocket. Surely the Commonwealth of Tennessee will not long permit this unsupported condition of such a game commissioner to endure. That state has a wild fauna worth preserving for her sons and grandsons and it is inconceivable that the funds vitally necessary to this public service cannot be found. Alabama I cite the case of Alabama because, in view of its position in a group of states that until recently have cared little about game protection, it may be regarded as an unusual case. Commissioner John H. Wallace, Jr. has evolved order out of chaos, and something approaching a reign of law out of the absence of law, Today the state of Alabama stands as an example of what can be accomplished by and through one clear-headed, determined man who is right, and knows that he is right. New Jersey Alabama reminds one of New Jersey, and of State Game Commissioner Ernest Napier. I have seen him on the firing line, and I know that his strong devotion to the interests of the wildlife of his state, his determination to protect it at all costs, and his resistless confidence in asking for what is right, have made him a power for good. The state legislature believes in him, and enacts the laws that he says are right and necessary. He serves without salary, and gives to the state time, labor, and money. It is a pleasure to work with such a man. In 1912, Commissioner Napier won a pitched battle with the makers of automatic and pump guns, both shotguns and rifles, and debarred all those weapons from use in hunting in New Jersey unless satisfactorily reduced to two shots. Massachusetts The state of Massachusetts is fortunate in the possession of a very fine corps of ornithologists, nature lovers, sportsmen, and leading citizens who on all questions affecting wildlife occupy high ground and are not afraid to maintain it. It would be a pleasure to write an entire chapter on this subject. The record of the Massachusetts Army of the Defense is both an example and an inspiration to the people of other states. Not only is the cause of protection championed by the State Game Commission, but it also receives constant and powerful support from the State Board of Agriculture, which maintains on its staff Mr. E. H. Forbush as State Ornithologist. The bird protection publications of the Board are of great economic value, and they are also an everlasting credit to the state. The very latest is a truly great wildlife protection volume of 607 pages by Mr. Forbush, entitled Game Birds, Wild Fowl, and Shore Birds. It is a publication most damaging to the cause of the Army of Destruction, and I heartily wish a million copies might be printed and placed in the hands of lawmakers and protectors. The fight last winter and spring for a no-sale of game law was the Gettysburg for Massachusetts. The voice of the people was heard in no uncertain tones, and the destroyers were routed all along the line. The leaders in that struggle on the protection side were E. H. Forbush, William P. Wharton, Dr. George W. Field, Edward M. Goading, Lyman E. Hurd, Ralph Holman, Rev. William R. Lord, and Salem D. Charles. With such leaders and such supporters, any wildlife cause can be won anywhere. 
Pennsylvania. The case of Pennsylvania is rather peculiar. As yet there is no large and resistless organized body of real sportsmen to rally to the support of the State Game Commission in great causes, as is the case in New York. As a result, with a paltry fund of only $20,000 for annual maintenance, and much opposition from hunters and farmers, the situation is far from satisfactory. Fortunately, Dr. Joseph Kelpfus, Secretary of the Commission and Chief Executive Officer, is a man of indomitable courage and determination. But for this state of mind, he would ere this have given up the fight for the hunter's license law, of one dollar per year, which has been bitterly opposed by a very aggressive and noisy group of gunners, who do not seem to know that they are grievously misled. Fortunately, Commissioner John M. Phillips of Pittsburgh is the ardent supporter of Dr. Kalbfus, and a vigorous fighter for justice to wild life. He devotes to the cause a great amount of time and effort and in addition to serving without salary he pays all his campaign expenses out of his own pocket his only recompense for all this is the sincere admiration of his friends and the consciousness of having done his full duty toward the wild life and the people of his native state the state audubon societies it is impossible to estimate the full value of the influence and work of the state audubon societies of the united states Thus far, these societies exist in 39 states. From the beginning, their efforts have tended especially toward the preservation of the non-game birds, and it is well that the song and other insectivorous birds have thus been specially championed. Unfortunately, however, if that policy is pursued exclusively, it leaves 154 very important species of game birds practically at the mercy of the Army of Destruction. It would seem that the time has come when all Audubon societies should take up, as part of their work, active cooperation in helping to save the game birds from extermination. The National Organizations of New York City On January 1, 1895, the United States of America contained, so far as I am aware, not one organization of national scope which was devoting any large amount of its resources and activities to the protection of wildlife. At that time, the former activities of the AOU Committee on Bird Protection had lapsed. Today, the City of New York contains six national organizations, and it is now a great center of nationwide activities in behalf of preservation. Furthermore, these activities are steadily growing and securing practical results. The New York Zoological Society in 1895 there was born into the world a scientific organization having for its second declared object the preservation of our native animals. It was the first scientific society or corporation ever formed, so far as I am aware, having a specifically declared object of that kind. It owes its existence and its presence in the field of wildlife conservation to the initiative and persistence of Mr. Madison Grant and Professor Henry Fairfield Osborne. For sixteen years these two officers have worked together virtually as one man. It is not strange to find a sportsman like Mr. Grant promoting the wildlife cause, but it is a fact well worthy of note that of all the zoologists of the world, Professor Osborne is the only one of real renown who has actively and vigorously engaged in this cause, and taken a place in the front rank of the defenders. Mr. Grant's influence on the protection cause has been strong and far-reaching far more so than the majority of his own friends are aware. He has promoted important protectionist causes from Alaska to Louisiana and Newfoundland, and helped to win many important victories. The Boone and Crockett Club This organization of big game sportsmen was founded in 1885, and is the oldest of its kind in the United States. Its members have always supported the cause of protection, by law and by the making of game preserves. In all this work, Mr. George Bird Grinnell, for twenty-five years editor of Forest and Stream, has been an important factor. As stated elsewhere, the club's written and unwritten code of ethics in big game hunting is very strict. In course of time, a committee on game protection was formed, and it actively entered that field. The National Association of Audubon Societies This organization was founded by William Dutcher in 1902, and in 1906 it was endowed to the extent of $322,000 by the bequest of Albert Wilcox. Subsequent endowments, together with the annual contributions of members and friends, now give the association an annual income of $60,000. In 
It maintains eight widely separated field agents and lecturers and forty special game wardens of bird refuges. It maintains Secretary T. Gilbert Pearson and a number of other good men constantly on the firing line. And these forces have achieved many valuable results. After years of stress and struggle, it now seems almost certain that this organization will save the two white egrets, producers of the white badge of cruelty, to the bird fauna of the United States, as in a similar manner it has saved the gulls, terns, and other seabirds of our lakes and coastlines. This splendid organization is one of the monuments to William Dutcher. More than two years ago he was stricken with paralysis, and now sits in an invalid's chair at his home in Plainfield, New Jersey. His mind is clear, and his interest in wildlife protection is keen, but he is unable to speak or to write. While he was active, he was one of the most resourceful and fearless champions of the cause of the vanishing birds. To him the farmers of America owe ten times more than they will ever know, and a thousand times more than they will ever repay, either to him or to his cause. THE CAMPFIRE CLUB OF AMERICA Although founded in 1897, this organization did not, as an organization, actively enter the field of protection until 1909. Since that time its work has covered a wide field and enlisted the activities of many of its members. In order to provide a permanent fund for its work, each year the club members pay special annual dues that are devoted solely to the wildlife cause. The Committee on Game Protective Legislation and Preserves is a strong, hard-working body, and it has rendered good service in the lines of activity named in its title. The American Game Protective and Propagation Association This is the youngest protective association of national scope, having been organized in 1911. Its activities are directed by John B. Burnham, for five years Chief Game Protector of the State of New York and a man thoroughly conversant with the business of protection. The organization is financed chiefly by means of a large annual fund contributed by several of the largest companies engaged in manufacturing firearms and ammunition, whose directors feel that the time has come when it is both wise and necessary to take practical measures to preserve the remnant of American game. Already the activities of this organization cover a wide range, and it has been particularly active in enlisting support for the Weeks Bill for the Federal Protection of Migratory Birds. The Wildlife Protection Association came into existence in 1910, rather suddenly, for the purpose of promoting the cause of the Bain No Sale of Game Bill and other measures. It raised the fund that met the chief expenses of that campaign. Since that time it has taken an important part in three other hotly contested campaigns in other states, two of which were successful. At the present moment, and throughout the future, these New York organizations need large sums of money with which to meet the legitimate expenses of active campaigns for great measures. They need some money from outside the state of New York. Too much of the burden of national campaigning has been and is being left to be borne by the people of New York City. This policy is growing monotonous. There is every reason why Chicago, St. Louis, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Boston should each year turn a hundred thousand dollars into the hands of these well-equipped and well-managed national organizations whose officers know how to get results all over our country. Such organizations as these do not exist in other cities, and this is very unfortunate. New Orleans should be a center of protectionist activity for the South, San Francisco for the Pacific Slope, and Chicago for the Middle West. Will they not become so? Two Independent Workers At the western edge of the delta of the Mississippi, there have arisen two men who loom up into prominence at an outpost of the Army of Defense, which they themselves have established. For what they have already done in the creation of wildflower preserves in Louisiana, Edward A. McIlhenny and Charles Willis Ward deserve the thanks of the American people at large. An account of their splendid activities, and the practical results already secured, will be found in Chapter 38 on Private Game Preserves, and in the story of Marsh Island. Already the home of these gentlemen, Avery Island, Louisiana, has become an important center of activity in wildlife protection. End of chapter 26